Welcome to Undertold Verbatim. I'm Solveig Renan for the Undertold Stories Project. We report from all over the world for PBS NewsHour. We've talked to experts and people making a difference in their communities. In this podcast, we're revisiting those undertold stories to share extended interviews we've done with changemakers around the world. One of the more popular restaurants in Bangkok has an unusual name. Cabbages and condoms isn't your average eatery. And it's not just because rubbers are everywhere. On sculptures, lanterns, even a condom Santa Claus at Christmas time. The restaurant has become an icon for what's widely regarded as one of the world's most successful family planning programs. Bringing a little humor to a taboo-laden topic is the trademark of Michai Viravaidya, <laughs> or as he's known in his native Thailand, the condom king. So we said, look, one must not be embarrassed by the condom. It's just from a rubber tree, like a tennis ball, if you're embarrassed by it. Kandam, you must be more embarrassed by the tennis ball. There's more rubber in it. No surprise then that in Thailand, condoms are commonly called michais. He started out working to stabilize a growing population and reduce poverty through family planning, a key factor in Thailand's growth into a middle income nation. When HIV AIDS hit, a similar condom based campaign became useful once more one that's widely credited with a dramatic drop in the number of HIV infections from about 140,000 a year in 1990 to about 30,000 cases a year a decade later. Michai hasn't slowed down. He's one change agent that we keep coming back to. Our correspondent Fred DeSam Lazaro has interviewed Michai many times, most recently in April 2020 by video call to see how the school Michai founded is faring during the COVID-19 pandemic. In this episode of Undertold Verbatim, we've collected some of our favorite chats with Michai over the years, so you can hear how he's worked with bureaucrats, religious leaders, the media, and directly with communities as an activist while founding schools and businesses to sustain his mission. He sat down with Fred at Cabbages and Condoms. You know, first of all, talk a little bit about this this enterprise that we're sitting in right now. With the, with the, well, we the are in thing. Cabbages and Condoms restaurant. It's one of our 16 businesses. As a non-governmental organization, charitable organization, we depend on other people's resources and generosity. They give us funds to do our programs. But this will not last forever. So we realize that we have to generate our own resources. What people give us come from their surplus or profit. We have to generate our own profits not be so dependent on donors. And so for 25 years now, we've had businesses registered as a separate legal entity, paying tax, and the profits are given to us as others give to us to run our program. Almost 70% of our financial needs come from these companies. We call these companies Business for Social Progress. Here's one of our earlier interviews. In 2007, Miche explained to Fred just how he tossed out the taboo that comes with talking about condoms and birth control, about marketing the idea of family planning. The thing that we hear in some parts of the world, uh, in the subcontinent for example, is that for a lot of poor people, um, more children means more hands, more income. It's, it's pooled income, it's pooled farm labor. It's, at, at, at what point does realization come to them or at what threshold does it come that they say fewer children means a better life. Well, most important of all and whatever action we're talking about or whatever information we're talking about must be discussed at the grassroots level. You can't do it in the urban area and broadcast it on radio, television, newspapers and expect these people to, to participate and understand it. So it's discussed at the low level. We start asking how many acres of land did your grandparents have? Then how many do you have? Why didn't you get a hundred? Why did you get ten? Well, because there were ten children to split up the ten. I said, how many children do you have now? And they may say five. Said, how many acres per child will your children get? They said, only two. So wow, and, and, and many have come up, gee, I wish my grandparents had fewer and so on. And then they realized that. So that's the start. The other point that is very well to send people into town for labor as long as there's a market for employment. 
once it's full, it becomes a burden rather than an asset. You can't send them in for employment, there's no employment. On the farm, same time, if you've got lots of land, you need more labor. When you have little land, you don't need all that labor. In fact, you have to sell your labor to other people because, because of too many children in the family, the pieces of land became so small. They realize this pretty soon, and then they know that education, while free, there are other costs, transportation costs, food, books, and apparently Thailand values education. So a lot of people say that I would like my children to have better education. So also we, we, we had a very strong program with the Buddhist monks who uh, are the most influential in the villages. And at the same time with teachers, rural school teachers, we trained almost 100%, 320,000 rural school teachers about population and family planning. And then we added in uh, the new alphabet where B for birth, C for condom, I for IUD. We had a children's song that would be equivalent to the West, like Jingle Bells. We changed all the words around and the song had about the misery of having too many children, not enough to eat, the heartache of parents, and then the realization that we don't have to worry, we now have contraceptives. So the song uh, mentions every contraceptive method. So every school child aged 8, 9, 10 knew of every contraceptive method. And so that's how the whole system began. Thailand's literacy rate is, is almost universal. How important a component is that in, in accounting for the success? I would say uh, it helped a lot for the, few, the future generation. But for the current generation of adults then, it was a matter of first having child survival. If children keep on dying, no one can practice family planning. And a lot of people had to have eight children to have three survive. So maternal and child mortality was very important. So maternal child health is a very uh, important partner of any family planning program. If your children die, who's going to practice family planning? So the children have to survive, then you can limit. So those are the very important elements. And then the ones who uh, were adults at the time, apart from that, then you just say these contraceptives are easy, they're safe. You can choose whatever method you wish. You can have the condom, the pill, or you can have the IUD or the injectable. Or when you've had enough children, then you can go on to sterilization. Choice. Totally voluntary, grassroots operated. And those people understood. And the next generation were the children who heard about it in school. They also saw what was happening. So the two went side by side, one for the future generation, one for the current generation. And this, the dispensing of all of this, this contraception and information was happening in a public health kind of No, it was context. happening in a local village shop where people go, where the shopkeeper knows the customers always right, so he sells sugar, milk, bread, fish sauce, toothpaste, cigarettes, matches. Added to that were pills and condoms. So it was sold in a very normal way, not in a clinical way. We wanted people to feel the family planning was like you know, soap and toothpaste and powder, an ordinary health product that you didn't have to go to clinic, a clinic for because that means it's very difficult, very sophisticated, and therefore quite dangerous. We made it simple. Mm -hmm. But in order to, to provide better public health um, overall so that these children survive, the infant mortality rate improved, I mean, was mm -hmm. there a concurrent we, we, we were a key partner with the Ministry of Health. They did, we did the public education and they did the immun, actual immunization of children uh, for the women, pregnant women to go for prenatal care, postnatal care, breastfeeding, and we did the contraceptives. But we told about it, but the service of these were provided by the government. You had to travel quite a long way for it, but they did. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the, the advent of <coughs> contraception as an item akin to soap and toothpaste as opposed to something that you discussed in hushed tones with your doctor. I think the two key issues are the pills and the condom. The pills in most countries of the world to this day are prescribed by doctors. Now when we started in Thailand in the uh, early 70s, we had one doctor per 110,000 people outside municipal areas. So it was a virtual impossibility. So the program uh, introduced by the Ministry of Public Health was to train nurses and with a checklist that you know, if you have these conditions, then you shouldn't take the pill. 
if you don't have these conditions, it's safe, this is how you do it. It succeeded very well. It expanded the horizon. But that only covered the towns. So they went one step further and trained auxiliary midwives to do the same thing. And they were very successful also because it was woman to woman. However, that only covered 20% of the villages and that was already the end of the line of the health service people. So we came in for the next 80% and we told the government, explained, and they approved that this would extend the service out to the people so they wouldn't have to walk or travel for 60, 70 kilometers or miles to get contraceptives. They could get right there in their village. So that's where we came in. So we became a sort of link in the chain, very close cooperation. If they needed something more sophisticated than pills and condoms, they came to, to, to the government clinic. They paid a small amount of money for the pills and condoms, but the pill was made available in a, in a very simple way as if you buy your toothpaste. In fact, it's put beside the toothpaste and soap. don't have to go to a clinic for it. it. Soap is not dangerous. Toothpaste isn't dangerous. So the pill and the condoms, of course, are not dangerous. Although there is a difference uh, medically between pills and condoms, obviously. I mean, the, the, the perception, the perception of pills as against toothpaste and so on. That if you are of a particular health standard, it's safe. It doesn't kill you, so not dangerous. And that was perception. If you had some side effects, it was explained. And if you persisted with the side effects, you could change or go to see the midwife further in town, change to another brand of pill or to another method altogether. So everything was there and you had a choice. And the condoms were in particular in terms of desensitization. People were embarrassed, they didn't talk about it. But the condom rather than the pill generate the most excitement or controversy or reaction. And wherever we did that, it, it brought out that issue. So we said, look, one must not be embarrassed by the condom. It's just from a rubber tree, like a tennis ball. If you're embarrassed by the condom, you must be more embarrassed by the tennis ball. There's more rubber in it. We said you could use it as a balloon, as a tourniquet for snake bites and deep cuts. You can use the lubrication for aftershave lotion and use the ring of the condom as a hairband. What a wonderful product. Why be embarrassed by it? Knives kill, and you're not embarrassed by that. Condoms save lives, and you're embarrassed. Something's wrong. So let's get used to the condom. So we gave them out all over and said, look, the condom is clean if your mind is not dirty. So please take one. And a lot of you know, people laughed and did. And then the next was the condom blowing championship. This really brought people a great sense of relaxation. They laughed. There'd be an audience of 200. We'd ask everyone to get a condom, to touch it, fold it, hold it, blow it up. And then we would have a competition for the one with the biggest blown up condom without bursting. So they saw the strength of it, the cleanliness. Once they put their condom to their lips, things have changed in their mind. So this is what we did to desensitize, not just the issue of, I mean, of condoms, but of contraceptives as a whole. So that was a major thing. And of course, they don't teach any of this. In universities, we picked it up by observing the public. Many experts say Thailand's stable population was no coincidence. But as per capita income and gross domestic product increased, so did inequality between urban areas and rural. That became Michai's next target. As Michai's operation grew, he expanded focus and began attacking poverty from another direction. Here's a clip from our 2019 report about the Michai Bamboo School. The Bamboo School was started nine years ago in rural eastern Thailand as a way to inspire young villagers to bring economic development to their communities. <laughs> On a typical day, students might be performing for patients at a nearby hospital. That's after handing out meals they had prepared at the school kitchen using produce grown in the school garden. <laughs> Students do learn in traditional classrooms, but the emphasis is on hands-on. Soon, these math students are outside taking measurements and making real-world calculations about how much can be planted in a pot. So this is mobile. You can take it into the villages from one house to another on the back of a motorbike. It's a portable solar-powered water pump, designed, he said, by the students. And this is what we're always trying to do, let the kids think how to improve uh, whatever we do. 
and they come up with many good ideas. Six years after our first story on the bamboo school, Fred returned for a progress report. What are, the, in your mind, the most significant things that have changed since then, grown, things learned, things unlearned? Well, in terms of outside people, a lot more interest. More people have come, have seen, have asked questions, have realized that what can be done is possible for them also. So that's the first one. And we've been able to, to add on, for instance, from just helping a school to have vegetable garden and to have income, to have a loan fund, into turning a school into a gateway for social and economic advancement in all the villages surrounding the school. So all of a sudden we see the school as a diamond. It was a sort of a piece of glass before, and we had not seen it in early days. And after the school has been going for some time, we've been able to see this. So that we now see huge potential. And the other one that we have seen is that the government has become very, very interested, including the Prime Minister. And he has asked us to take a lead in what they now call the partnership school, whereby business communities are asked to partner with government schools and to improve the running of the school, to be on the board, to be the chair, and to get people out of poverty, to reduce migrations. In other words, all of a sudden, the Prime Minister now has come up with a new policy in education based on what will be done, where the school is more than just a school that all of us used to know, a school as a lifelong learning center and a hub for social and economic advancement in the communities. And now we begin to see how we can help other countries. Now we're going to along the border between Thailand and Laos and Vietnam, uh, Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar to have a school on either side and slowly expand. I hope that there will be sufficient interest in donor communities into the uh, Mekong countries uh, to have this sort of approach. And I think that the whole world can recognize the fact that you have so many schools, they all have legal uh, it, they become legal entities, there's land, there's building, there's teachers, underutilized, and the school all around the world can be used as a new entry point for social and economic advancement. Um, it just seems so simple right now. We didn't see it before, now we see it very clearly, and people seem to like it. Uh, there seems to be nobody opposing the concept that a school can be more than what it used to be. Is there anything that you thought was a good idea when you began this that uh, mm. evolved to be less than a good idea, things that you had to change or just abandon? Here. My approach has stayed the same, but I'm more realistic in the limitation of funds to help expand these activities. For instance, we have so many people saying, oh, we should have this sort of school all over the place. I said, well, I don't have a money printing machine. So that's the limitation at this stage. It could be because we have not made ourselves sufficiently well known to the people who do have the resources to help us expand. So that's one thing we probably have to do in the future. And if uh, organizations around the world can agree with it and can help, can help to do with it, I would be happy to, to join in the movement. One of the, the, the constants in, in your life has been uh, the embrace of causes for marginalized people. Mm -hmm. And yet the roots of what started it all are in family planning and in condoms. Explain the continuity, if, if there is one. What did you just make a U-turn somewhere or a, a sharp Well, I was pivot? in government and uh, I had a radio program, I had a television program, I had a newspaper column, I taught at university. So those things gave me uh, an audience which, which was, was very beneficial in getting ideas across. And by going out up country and I realized that we had so many children and we needed to reduce the birth rate. So that's the first part, but it took a long time to get the government to agree to a policy. There was policy, but no money. So I started getting money from the outside to get a policy, uh, to get a program started of making contraceptives available all over the place. So that changed from seven kids per family to be under two uh, in, in over 20 years it worked. Then HIV came along, and we also had to do that. We didn't design HIV. It came along and we said, we didn't do anything about it, all the benefit gains which had been achieved would be wiped out. So we tackled it and we had to do many things to, 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 to go behind the backs of the government, to the military to get the, the program 
on television and radio stations of the military to get it done. So that came along. And then at the same time, from family planning, we also had poverty eradication. The best people to help you out of poverty is to get the people to know how to make money. Government only knows how to take money. So we went to the business community in a partnership with the poor communities to get activities going. So we went straight to the, to the, the, the village. And then, of course, social ent entrepreneurship has been going along right from day one to help businesses, to help yourself and put profit back in. But then, over, just over 10 years ago, we came across this need to improve education. So that's what we introduced in Goy. So it was one thing led to another. It was just It was a natural tendency that we said that education really needs to be improved because people were coming through education and not showing very much in terms of achievement from all that money spent. We are the second highest proportion of the naf national budget in terms of education in the whole world behind Hong Kong. But the results are disastrous. So how did that realization come to you that, that this is where energy needed to be spent? I started giving scholarships, uh, asking for money. And then I realized that that was giving them at best mediocrity, gave them opportunity to reach mediocrity. Why not? have your own printing press, why not have your own school? And that was the idea when I saw what was happening in the regular school system, we came up with our own school. We're putting this podcast together in October of 2020, while the United States continues to battle COVID-19. The pandemic threw a wrench briefly in many of Michai's projects, including the Bamboo School. Fred connected again with Michai by video call in April, since then, Thailand and many of its neighbors have managed to flatten the curve. With a population of 70 million, Thailand has seen fewer than 100 COVID deaths. But it has not reopened its borders to tourists, a large driver of its economy and the cash registers at places like cabbages and condoms. The restaurant has nonetheless reopened. So too has the bamboo school, after students were sent home for weeks. Michai told Fred they went with some money and instructions on how to put it to use. Well, we believe that the fact that they have learned how to grow vegetables extremely well, we are asking them to grow vegetables at home at this time to have food and to earn income, and we would also like them to use the money we can provide them in the future to buy vegetable seeds, to give them to elderly people in the villages to grow vegetables to help themselves. You've emphasized life skills in the school, and uh, all of a sudden, they're being put to use very, very quickly in real life, unexpectedly. This is a, a, a situation that we didn't anticipate, but we had always wanted to get them ready for whatever future, but we did not expect it to be as severe as it is, and we're glad that we have started, we have started doing this with the students uh, earlier on. All right. Well, Micha Virabhadya, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? We well, would like to send our best wishes to all the people listening to the program. And I know times are difficult, but cheer up. It's not the end of the world. We will win at the end. All right. Our interviews with Micha Virabhadya have been featured in many of our PBS NewsHour stories. To explore his work throughout the years, go to undertoldstories.org. This episode was hosted and edited by me, Solve Runin, and produced by Simeon Lancaster. The interviews were conducted by our director, Fred DeSam Lazaro. You can find every Undertold Verbatim episode, virtual reality 360 experiences, and our entire library of Undertold news reports from around the world at undertoldstories.org. Undertold Verbatim is brought to you by the Undertold Stories Project, based at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. As always, thanks for your support. <laughs>